your presentation. Uh, thank you, Swaib. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, good morning as well. So as we mentioned, my name is Paisal Khan. Uh, I'm from Department of Anesthesiology, Khan University Hospital. So I will talk uh, on the respiratory failure and what's the situation with the COVID-19. My talk would be in tutti frutti like, you know, I'll speak in English and would do both. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm starting uh, with this, uh, with, with the first slide, uh, no, no conflict of uh, uh, interest. So my, my red map is, uh, you know, in the next 30 minutes, what I would like to do and understand the pathophysiology of respiratory failure. We'll discuss, the, you know, the most common sign and symptoms related to the respiratory failure. We'll discuss some least common and uncommon causes of respiratory failure. And fourth, but most importantly, the respiratory failure in COVID patients, uh, how we used, uh, you know, this different respiratory therapy, not including the mechanical ventilation, mostly the oxygenated therapy. And lastly, we'll discuss on the non-invasive ventilation and high flow oxygen uh, for, these, uh, for these patients. So uh, I'm starting my talk with this case scenario, and of course, uh, you know, uh, not very much uncommon. It, it, it's a very much common in, in the in, in the unit that you come up with the respiratory failure patient in an ICU. So so this is a 65-year-old man with no known comorbidities, brought to the emergency room with the progressive dyspnea for the last three days, and he has a feeling of malaise and fatigue for the last three days. He has a respiratory failure of 30 beats per minute, and is by moderately distressed. He's using his accessory muscles and he has a mild wheezing on the, uh, when, when someone auscultated him. So uh, the question start from what findings suggest this patient is a respiratory failure? And I, I hope that you'd all, you know, uh, trying to find the answer of it, uh, wherever you are. So uh, this patient has many factors, you know, in this case scenario, like his high respiratory rate, he has a moderate distress, he's using accessory muscles. Uh, and he has some symptoms for the last few days. So this patient, of course, typically in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a respiratory failure. So whenever you have this type of patient, what you need to do, you need to evaluate him. You need to evaluate from, from you know, uh, from uh, head to toe. And of course, you all understand that the problem primarily is in the, in, in the lung, the problem of the, of the gas exchange. But of course, whenever you come up with this type of scenarios, uh, you, your main focus is in the in the uh, uh, in the lung, but you have to uh, you have to find problems in other areas of the body, and you need to go from from head, chest, you know, uh, and other uh, uh, other areas in in, in in the body. So, uh, if I ask a question, that you know, which of the following forms of respiratory failure is most likely in this patient? So, uh, like he has. So, you know, he has uh, some sort of, uh, uh, of uh, fatigue, is a fever, uh, he has reducing respiratory muscles and all these things. So if we come, if, if you have a question like he has a hypoxemic respiratory failure, hypercapnic respiratory failure, or the mixed respiratory failure. So, and I hope that most of the people have answered very easily that this patient might have the hypoxemic respiratory failure because whenever you come up with the with this type of scenario, it's very much important that you try to find the reason because the reason tells you what sort of intervention you may need in the next few minutes. But in an ICU, uh, let me tell you that most of the time, uh, I'm not I'm not uh, referring this scenario now, but uh, most of the time we, can, we, we come up with a mixed respiratory failure and we intubate the patient and all these things. So uh, we also need to learn about, uh, you know, we, 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 we may have a, a scenario when this hypoxemic and the hypercapnic both uh, comes together. But uh, as such, in this case scenario, if we, if, we, if we talk about, this is the, apparently looks like the most common is the hypoxemic respiratory failure when the patient is a tachypnea and, you know, so come up with the definition of the respiratory failure. Uh, respiratory failure is, is, is this is the most, you know, easiest uh, uh, definition, which is very much understandable that respiratory failure is present when the pulmonary system no longer can meet your metabolic demand. So the primary focus is the pulmonary system, but you know, if, when, when we say that this no longer can meet the metabolic demand, it, it means that the pulmonary system does not able to, you know, offload the demand of the body. Uh, so what is the primary function of the pulmonary system? So the primary function of the pulmonary system is a gas exchange. Uh, so if, if, if the body, if, if your lung, sorry, is not able to maintain the gas exchange 
and uh, it's just a dysfunction over there, then uh, you, you, you can you know, uh, define that this patient has a respiratory failure because of inadequate gas exchange. And we talk about the gas exchange, you know, we, we all know that the primary function of the lung is to goes lungs uh, air goes in and the you know the body uh, carbon dioxide uh, goes out from the from 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 the lungs to outside the air this is the primary function of the lung the oxygenation and the ventilation and as i said to you uh, you know uh, that this is not the primary whenever you have a respiratory failure the primary problem is in the lung the primary problem can anywhere in the body the primary problem can happen in the chest wall, like the patient has some abnormal, deformed chest, you know, chest trauma. He may have a problem in the pleura, like massive pleural effusion, hemothorax, pneumothorax, he has a diaphragm dysfunctions. The problem can be in the airways, you know, the stride, the airway obstruction, tumor, large thyroid can lead to the, you know, the, the respiratory failure. And most importantly, the alveolar capillary units dysfunction. And you know, we uh, as an intensivist, uh, most of the time face this clinical, uh, this entity as a clinical, uh, you know, uh, appearance like pulmonary edema, pneumonia, uh, uh, contusion, and all these things. And the other important part is the pulmonary circulation, like uh, whatever it is, like uh, pulmonary embolism is the most common factor. The other would be the nerves injuries, like if you have some diaphragmatic dysfunction, uh, myasthenia, GBS, sinus disorders like head trauma, uh, narcotic poisoning, brainstem issues. So, you, so whenever you have you, you you have a patient with a respiratory failure, you need to understand uh, the the problem can anywhere in in the body, and the the pulmonary system is not able to compensate that problem. So that's why it was very important that whenever you have this, you need to uh, try to find out the, the primary etiology and then do the interventions accordingly. As I said to you, uh, you know, whenever the, the, the primary function of the, of the lung is oxygenation and ventilation. So uh, there are many, many types of respiratory failure, but I make it more simple and put it to you like the hypoxemic, the type one respiratory failure, when the primary problem is in the oxygenation, when you're, when in the room air, the PO2 is less than 60 millimeter of mercury. You may have abnormal PO2, FiO2 ratio if your patient is, uh, you know, uh, ventilated, uh, because the PO2, FiO2 ratio tells you about the gas exchange adequacy. If you have a low PO2, FiO2, it may be, you know, the, 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 the intensity of the gas exchange more and more worse. But uh, for those who are working outside, I can tell them that if you have uh, if you have SpO2, the plethysmographic measurement of the oxygenation, so you may calculate the SpO2 FiO2 ratio as well, and this gives you some idea about the about the, about the oxygenation on the gas exchange. The other type of respiratory failure is hypercapnic, uh, and this is not all. This is also not very much uh, you know uncommon, and this is define the type two respiratory failure when your PSCO2 is more than 50 millimeter of mercury, the high PSCO2. And you may have a normal, or most of the time, you may have a high, sorry, the, the low PAO2 as well, because of the high amount of PSO2 in the alveoli displaces the oxygen. And of course, the, the second important thing would be your uh, pH. And when you do the blood gas, you may have a low uh, pH of less than 7.36. And lastly, the mixed respiratory failure, as I said, you may have hypoxemic and hypercapnic respiratory failure together. Uh, and I can give you an example of it, like if you have a patient of severe air flow obstruction, asthma and COPD, when you try to you know, tired off, you may find both these problems of the high PSU2 and the low PO2, and you think about different strategies to overcome this. And as I said, uh, you know, you need to know, uh, because these two types of respiratory failure, uh, when you try to, to find out the reason, you do some uh, diagnostic test, and when you come up with the radiological picture, 
So the type type one respiratory failure mostly the it, the problem is in the gas exchange. The problem is in the you know alveolar capillary membrane dysfunction, the, the severe pneumonia, severe contusions, uh, pulmonary edema, ARDS, and all these things. The the upper upper you know uh, the upper picture. And the lowest you may, you may have, uh, if those who work in ICU or those who work in the pulmonology clinic, they, this is a very norm, you know, routine sort of uh, radiological picture when you have a hyperinflated chest piece and it, typically the picture of <laughs> those who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, uh, emphysematous bullying in the lung and all this, and the teardrop of, you know, the, the heart shadow. So uh, these pictures gives you an idea about the patient, patient, what type of respiratory failure the patient may have. So the same scenario, what I've just discussed a few slides before, the way you do the blood gas and the pH is 7.32. The PaCO2 is 30 millimeter of mercury, PO2 of 50 millimeter of mercury, bit high. And you did the chest radiograph and you find the same picture like the, the first radiological picture I've shown you in the, in, in the previous slide, you have interstitial marking the lower lobe. So the question is, why is this, why is this patient has an hypoxemic respiratory failure? This is important to know. And you need to try to learn that. This is also very much important because until you don't know the pathophysiology, you know, you not, may not be able to appropriately do the nice interventions. So why is this patient hypoxic? There are you know, the, 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 the causes of the hypoxemic and the causes of the hypercapnic a slight, uh, you know, uh, difference in, in, in the reasons. And the, there are three important, you know, uh, problems when, when we, we come up with the hypoxemic respiratory failure is the ventilation perfusion mismatch. Secondly is the alveolar hypoventilation. And third is the high altitude. So I'm just showing you this slide, this, this cartoon, but it tells you, you know, you have, uh, this is the alveoli, the red color is the oxygen, the blue color dot is the carbon dioxide, and the, the below the, uh, the alveoli is the, is the capillary, the pulmonary vessels, and between this alveoli and the, uh, you know, the capillary, there is some uh, disruptions over there. There is one more thing, uh, you know, you can see here. This might be the fluid. This might be the, the disease. This might be the pus. This might be the disruption of the... So this is the impaired diffusion between these, uh, the alveoli and the, and, and the capillary membrane. And this can lead to a ventilation perfusion mismatch. And this can lead to a problem of the, of the hypoxia. In the next slide, I will just show you what type of perfusion ventilation mismatch we can uh, we see uh, in the in, in the pathophysiological uh, uh, you know sense the second would be the alveolar hypoventilation so you see in this second uh, picture this is the alveoli same but the capillary pulmonary vessels over there below the alveoli you can't see any you know disruption of any any other foreign body between this alveoli and the and the and the vessel but what is happening over there? The, the, the problem is there's a lot of blue dots in the vessel and a lot of blue dots in the, in the alveoli. Does it mean there's a high accumulation of carbon dioxide? And this carbon dioxide sometimes displaces the oxygen as well. And you may come up with this uh, scenario of high PCO2 as well as high, uh, low oxygen. And this is defined as the alveolar hypoventilation. And you can, you can see, this, uh, this picture, when uh, you have some high doses of sedatives, you have some narcotic poisonings, and, and the uh, other clinical pictures. And the last one would be the causes of hypoxemia is the, is the high altitude. High altitude means whenever you go in the high uh, areas above the sea, you may have a low oxygen partial pressure. So this is very easy to, to learn that whenever you have a low oxygen, you have a low entry into the, into the, into the respiratory tract. So low entry into the respiratory tract means a low transfer from alveoli to the pulmonary vessels and there is a, is a, a reason of hypoxemia. So this is three important causes we need to understand when we deal with the patient uh, with the uh, you know, hypoxemia, the impaired diffusion, the alveolar hypoventilation and the high altitude. 
So this slide tells you about uh, the ventilation perfusion mismatch. So I'm starting from slide, the, 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 the picture uh, B, this is the normal, this is the alveoli, and the last is the pulmonary vessel. So nice, you know, uh, 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 nice picture, which tells you about the normal, uh, normal architecture. But in, if, you, if you see this, the, the, the picture of, uh, of uh, A, the alveoli collapse, maybe because of any, many reasons. I'm not going to detail of that reason now, but, and you see the collapse alveoli, and the, and, but the pulmonary vessel is normal. The blood flow is going. So whatever the blood flow is moving, it has no, you know, uh, oxygen because the alveoli is collapsed. This is defined as a shunt, the wastage blood flow, the wastage oxygenation. And if you see the picture in, in, in the C, you have a normal alveoli, but when you see the blood vessel, uh, it's, it's constricted because of, because of any reason, because of the most common is the, is the pulmonary embolism. And the ventilation is good, but there is no, no blood flow. So the, whatever you know, the air goes in, it has no role in the gas exchange. So this is the, defined as a dead space, the vestige ventilation. So these are these two, the shunt and the dead space, uh, is the is the you know basic physiology in the hypoxemia, and there are many uh, clinical pictures comes under these headings of the shunt and the dead space. I will show you in the next few slides. <coughs> so now coming to the to type of respiratory failure, as I said, the type one, the type one, the problem in the hypoxemia. And there's a list of the, I just put this, the, the important list which you usually see in your, uh, in your critical patients like the pneumonia, the cardiogenic pulmonary edema because of the high intra, increase in the intra, uh, hydrostatic pressures, the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the most commonly we have seen the complications of the pneumonia like acute lung injury, the acute respiratory distress syndrome because of the leaky membrane. And the other three important things are the pulmonary embolism, the telectasis, the collapsed lung, and the pulmonary fibrosis. So if you have a type 1 respiratory failure, think about this. Now coming to the hypercapnia. The hypercapnia means it covers the part of the ventilation. And we know uh, we, we need to consider the alveolar minute ventilation not the minute ventilation. And the definition of the alveolar vent ventilation is, it's a difference between the, the tidal ventilation and the dead space ventilation multiplied by the respiratory rate. So normally we have a dead space of one to two ml per kg. It's a conducting airways. So if you just uh, you know, deduct it, this is the you know, tidal ventilation. So if you have increased dead space ventilation, of course, it uh, reduces your albedo ventilation and there's a risk of hypercapnia. And what are the common causes of this, uh, you know, uh, the hypercapnia? Uh, the hypovolumia, when there's no blood flow, you may have uh, no transfer of the carbon dioxide uh, in the pulmonary vessels, in the accumulation of the carbon dioxide in the blood, and you may have the high PCO2, the low cardiac output, the pulmonary embolism, and the high airway pressure. The high airway pressure means Whenever you ventilate your patient with the you know, positive pressure ventilation, it increases your dead space and it compresses the, the vessels and increases the risk of the, of the hypercapnia hyper and the dead space ventilations. And this is the, the, the picture uh, on it. So there are two types we talked about and now what are the causes of this type 2 respiratory failure? Of course, the most common is the central hypoventilation, uh, the asthma when the patient starts to tire off, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, whenever you deal this patient in ICU, you, you may start to see the mixed type of respiratory failure. Uh, the other one would be neuromuscular disease like myopathies, neuropathies, neuromyasthenia, GBS, neuromuscular dis disorders. If someone has a kyphoscoliosis, they usually have a high PCO2 because of the weak muscles. And lastly, the obesity hypoventilation syndrome because they have high PCO2 of, of the increased dead space ventilation. So whenever you have a respiratory failure, you need to uh, you need to understand the history. The history tells you about many things, like the patient comes with the cough, sputum production, the chest pain. You think about pneumonia. There would be the pulmonary embolism. You start to think about it. The patient has a long-standing bedridden history. Uh, he has he, he is on any you know uh, medications uh, of contraceptive pills. 
and the, uh, the innovation has a long standing history in the hospitalization spinal cord injuries so they may have the you know suspicion of uh, of pulmonary embolism uh, copd exacerbation you need to uh, see this in the history ask you can ask them that the patient has a heavy smoking curbs sputum productions uh, the, the fourth one is a cardiogenic pulmonary edema the patient may present with a chest pain proximal nocturnal dyspnea orthopnea high raised jvp uh you know uh, so uh, history of ischemic heart disease in the past so I mean, you may you may need to think about the cardiogenic pulmonary edema and of of course the last but not the you know the least the, the abnormalities in the neuromuscular uh, neuromuscular part of the body like if the patient have uh, exacerbation of gbs myasthenia exacerbation so they may have the, the the respiratory failure or some you know injection injection of the toxins like narcotics Uh, sedatives, hypnotics, they may have uh, the the respiratory failure. So, in history is really important. And then, of course, when you start some history, not a very in detail, but the short history tells you about what is happening. You need to do the blood gas. The blood gas tells you about the gas exchange abnormality, the PA, the PCO2, and the and and, and the PO2. It also tells you about the type of and chronicity of the respiratory failure. I'm not discussing it now here because of the you know. Uh, Uh, time plus change because but the blood gas tells you about the chronicity of the respiratory failure you need to do the blood uh, the cbc the uh, because of the infections uh, high wbc count lymphopenia and all you need to do with the electrolytes potassium abnormalities magnesium abnormalities uh, the bun and the creatinine if someone has a, you know a chronic acute renal failure they may have they may have uh respiratory failure but this may, this may be because of the metabolic problems of course you go with the radiological workup like chest x ray ct if needed cardiac cardiac workup of troponin if the patient you are thinking about the pulmonary edema secondary to the cardiac reasons microbiology is important you do uh, you send for blood culture you send for sputum culture like in in, in the covid scenario we usually do the pcr testing to find it out what the what the problem is now coming to the uh, another important part of the respiratory failure in covid patients and we all have learned now the, there are a lot of papers there is a lot of discussion there is a mm-hmm. coronavirus is a disease of the respiratory tract and the coronavirus is this third you know uh, in third in the family after the sars and the mers uh, and uh, and it started uh, you know it has it, it comes into the into the consideration when it was documented and came from the you know mohan china in december 29 so uh this slide what it tells you how the the coronavirus act it it, it bind with the angiotensin 2 receptors uh, the the expression of the uh, the down regulation of the ac2 uh, enzymes and the the four uh, pathophysiological mm-hmm. entity you see the like acute lung injury myocarditis severe cardiogenic shock can happen severe vasoconstrictions and the vascular permeability problem which come up with the severe ARDS bilateral lung infiltrates i don't know how if you if you if you can see this picture so it start from up till down when you have see the alveoli with the yellow picture so in 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 the first uh, alveolar uh, area you see there's a normal alveoli with the the with the surfactant type 1 and type 2 uh, cells uh, the nice membrane uh, between the alveoli and the and the vessel but when the virus act on it it start to damage if you see the third picture like there's a disruption of the of the of the alveolar capillary membrane the fluid start to accumulate type 2 pneumocytes injured the vessel start to disintegrate and the, the the last one when you have you know the the massive uh, uh, enrollment of the disease and the massive massive disease pattern the the the, the alveoli filled with the fluid it could be pus and anything the vessel is damaged and the surfactant there is no surfactant so this is the very disease picture of the covid uh, 19 respiratory failure I'm I'm not going to detail of this slide, but I'm just trying that you focus in the stage two, the pulmonary phenomena, which usually happen from this day five to day seven till day you know, day day ten. 
So this, if you, if you focus this picture, the patient present with the shortness of breath, the patient may present with the hypoxia. If you do the blood gas, the PO2 to FiO2 ratio, you may find with less than 300 millimeter of mercury. And if you start to do the blood testing in the radiological picture, you may come up with the chest infiltrates. You may find the other organ damage of transaminitis. And you may have the primary viral infection, the low normal procalcitonin. But if you go to the uh, stage three, this would be the ARDS search and cardiac failure. This is the ultimate picture of the patient with the COVID-19 respiratory failure. When you deal this patient in the intensive care, they are in you know a severe organ failures, primarily the lung, but it can lead to the problem in the other part of the other part of the body, like myocarditis and, and the shock. Now, uh, this is the WHO, uh, you know, classification, the spectrum of the severity of the COVID-19 and start from mild illness. And this patient, this type of, you know, in this picture, you, the patient doesn't need to be in an in, uh, in hospital, but he, he may come up with a problem like fever, fatigue, curve, sputum production, non-specific symptoms like muscle pain, malaise, anorexia, but the patient who have, you know, elderly or the, on immunosuppressive, they may have atypical presentations, like they may not have a fever because of the immunosuppressive therapy, but they may have mild and muscle pain, but threateningly, you know, they come up with the more drastic complication rather than they come up with the mild illness. The second stage would be the pneumonia, uh, and they, now at this stage, they start to have a respiratory failure picture, the high respiratory rate, they may have a fever, they may have clinical radiological signs of the lung involvement, at this stage, if you start to do some laboratory investigations, you may have some in, uh, abnormality in, in them. And at this stage, you need to start the therapeutic intervention, like you may give oxygen, try to keep their saturation above 90 or 92, so that they may have good oxygen uh, in, in the body. And the last would be the severe pneumonia. Uh, when uh, this the second stage goes to the, to the severe form, and they have a respiratory rate of more than 30 breath, uh, breath per minute, severe respiratory rates, using muscle, muscles or accessory muscles, looking like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. under, under stress, tiring off, and uh, they have a low oxygen saturation on room air. And this type of patient needs, uh, you know, hospital, the, the HDU or uh, you, they may come up in intensive care as well if, you, if the clinical judgment sees like this. And this is the, the complication. This is the complicated form. This is the severe, severe form of the, of the, uh, of the uh, COVID-19 pneumonia when you have acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I'm just showing you the definition, the burden criteria of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. The, the onset is early onset. The definition is of within one week. Uh, the chest imaging uh, shows the bilateral opacity. It's not fully explained by volume overload but they may have, or, or the lung collapse and the, uh, and, the, and the nodule, but they may have a bilateral infiltrate. So you may see in the radiographic picture or the CT scan or someone who is doing the lung ultrasound, they may see different, uh, different signatures finding over there. And the origin of the pulmonary infiltrate, as we talked about, not the cardiogenic, uh, it should be, uh, you know, the primary pulmonary uh, origin. And the last, uh, you know, the, the, the four lines tell you about the oxygenation index, the problem of the gas exchange. Like if you have uh, the, the mild picture, when you have PO2 FI2 ratio is less than 300, but above 200, the PEEP of 5, or the CPAP of 5, or non ventilated. The moderate one is when you have a PO2 FI2 ratio is less than 200 millimeter of mercury, or above 100 millimeter of mercury, with the same setting of PEEP or CPAP. And the severe form is when you when the PO2 FI2 ratio is less than 100 millimeter of mercury. Last slide is last line is important. Those who who has no uh, blood gas you know uh, facility, they may see the SpO2, and they may find they may calculate the SpO2 FI2 ratio. And if this is less than 315, to may, it may suggest. I'm not saying it's conclusively test, but it may suggest that the patient has. Uh, at uh, the severe ARDS, if it follows the above uh, criteria as well. 
And uh, this is the symptoms at the all illness uh, onset. And I'm just showing you in the slide what is the frequency of the symptoms. The most common presentation is the fever. Uh, the other would be the myalgia and fatigue, 52%. <coughs> the cough is also very much common. It's around 82% of the patient. They may have um, uh, the cough presentations, the shortness of breath. But the, the other problem like sore throat, headache, uh, sputum, Hemoptysis is the less common findings, uh, but the uncommon we also need to consider in this pandemic or those who are elderly or you know you know a patient they may have a finding of the of the diarrhea uh, with with the fever. So uh, we need some time to consider these these people as well uh, in in those areas who have a very frequent finding of the COVID nineteen. This is the radiological uh, picture. Uh, so, uh, like 59% of the patient on admission present with the X-ray abnormalities, and this is the typical picture of those who have a bilateral infiltrates, typical consolidated lung, uh, very less aeration you can see in, in the left upper lobe. Uh, but if, if those who have a facility of the CT scan, uh, these three are the typical picture in the CT scan: the crown glass appearance, localized consolidation, and the bilateral consolidation. Uh, uh, in, in, in the CT scan finding, but, but the ground glass is very much, you know, commonly see uh, in, 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 the, in the clinical, in the neurological uh, CT scan finding. Now, we have, talk, we have learned a lot about the happy hypoxemia and the silent hypoxemia. And, and there's a lot of literature available which tells us that the patient comes to you, is looking very much, you know, under resting condition, is, uh, has no respiratory distress. But if you put the SPO2 uh, monitor, you see the saturation is 76. Oh, what is happening? This is defined as silent hypoxemia. The patient has a, a compliance lung. There is a very lack of, uh, you know, excessive dead space. And, but they have a very, you know, uh, low oxygen in the body. And these patients are really, really tricky. And <laughs> These patients are really under threatening condition because slight delay in the management, they may have uh, come up with the you know severe respiratory distress and maybe in the next 24 hours or 48 hours you may find an uh, intubated uh, and on a very high ventilator support on it. And what is the possible reason of it? Apparently, the possible reason would be the dysfunction hypoxemic uh, hypoxemic vasoconstriction, which is the natural phenomena basically in the body. The God has created us, like the the hypoxemic uh, has hypoxemic vasoconstriction. But if it is dysfunctional, the blood goes into that part of the lung, which is disease, and this leads to more shunting, and the patient is seems like hypoxemic, but there is no clinical distress picture over. Now, coming back to the therapy, uh, there are a lot of therapies we can do. We start from the oxygen, oxygen, the high frequency, the non-invasive, and lastly, the, you intubate the patient and put them into mechanical ventilation. I will not touch the mechanical ventilation part over there, but I'll touch the non-invasive and the high frequency part over there. But let me tell you one thing, for those who are working in the resource limited you know, area, oxygen, oxygen, and oxygen. This is very much important. You oxygenate them. And let me tell you one thing. You know, we talked about a lot how you need to do the take the history, how you need to investigate, how you need to go to the clinical examination. But in the respiratory failure, the most important thing are the supportive therapies. As such, we have learned a lot. There is no definitive therapy. So the supportive therapy is really and the safe supportive therapy. You need to you know you need to. Uh, you, uh, allow the patient, give everything, but it will not be injurious to them. And what sort of injury you may come up with, I will show you in the next few slides. And the second part is important because this is not a disease like a trauma and pneumonia, simple pneumonia. This is a disease which has a lot of infectivity and contagiousity. So proper, uh, you know, PPE is important for the healthcare staff. You need to, uh, you need to save yourself as well. And then, of course, you need to save your patient. And we have, we have already learned when you are, you know, you are in the aeroplane, it is always said by the, by the staff over there, please put the oxygen first yourself and then give to the other one. So, so uh, save yourself and, and do the appropriate intervention. 
So what the uh, intervention you can get, uh, the oxygen therapy, this is important. But of course, as I said, uh, give oxygen, but oxygen is a drug. So don't give oxygen like, you know, start with the, uh, with the 10 liters per minute and continue with the 10 liters per minute for 10 days. No, you need to monitor. You need to monitor the SpO2 and try to monitor the SpO2 around more than 92. If it is 94, 95, it's, it's, it's appropriate. So taper down your, your oxygen. And if you have a monitoring system available, and if the, the situation persists like more than, uh, you know, 92, uh, be calm and, and try to figure it out and monitor that what the disease progress is, uh, is, is this and how you can, you know, do the other things which can help the patient. So what are the, what are the, inter what are the, you know, different type of oxygen therapy we have? We have a two types of system, you know, the low flow and the high flow. And the low flow means that the variable performance devices uh, like nasal cannula, the face mask, the face mask with the rebreathing, and the wet. And the other part is the uh, the fixed performance device when you can fix your FIO2, the, the, like the venturi. Unfortunately, I didn't put it over there, but the venturi is also the part of it. So you can use the nasal cannula, but uh, you, you should know that you can maximum give the oxygen, the nasal cannula, the oxygen flow will be moved to four liters per minute. And it gives you the FI2 of, of 45. But as I said to you, it is a variable performance device. So the variable performance means that the, if the patient is very much hyperventilating, is using a lot of respiratory muscles, is a, he has a very much high respiratory rate. So maybe you may not be able to get the appropriate FI2, but you are thinking. So you may need to consider the other therapies like face mask. The face mask, if you give five to 10 liters of face mask, of course, you may get the FIO2 around 50, okay? And so, but it also depends, and this is our, all the variable performance device, so you need to monitor your patient, that what the patient demand is. And if the patient demand is increasing, you can may come up with the face mask with the rebreathing device, when you may increase your FIO2 up to 60%, and it gives you, uh, uh, and it, it gives a lot of support to the patient in terms of their respiratory distress because they get the good amount of oxygen. Uh, so it may help them in the, you know, the transfer of this oxygen in the, in, in, in the body and they may provide some, some, some rest to them. Now coming to the, to the uh, other, uh, you know, therapies, uh, the, the, the strategies like high flow nasal oxygen. The beauty in this is that it, uh, it's, it's a humidified and heated oxygen. And you increase the flow rate up to the 60 liters per minute. And uh, you can monitor the, the oxygen and it's very comforting to the patient as well. But what the dilemma is, this is, you know, you need, as I said to you, that you need to understand the pathophysiology and the infectivity of these patients. So what the dilemma is, you know, there are two, two pictures I'm just showing it here, the picture A and picture B. What's the problem in this picture? If you see the picture A, the nasal cannula is, you know, uh, is inserted, but it is not appropriate. There's a leak over there. And you see the picture B, there's a very really nicely fitted nasal cannula. So this is the very much important because we all have understand Still, uh, we, we are not very much sure, but uh, still uh, we are, you know, very much uh, concerned that the risk of aerosolization. So we all know that the high frequency and the NIV can increase the risk of aerosolization. So if you are using this, it need to be tightly fitted. And what the other thing you need to consider, I'm just showing you the next slide. Like this in, in this picture. So if you are using the, the nasal cannula, you may apply the nasal, the, the face mask so that the risk of uh, spread of the disease can be, can be minimized. But what advices, you know, you need to, you need to uh, consider. So if you're using the high flow up to 40 and 50, you need to uh, use the negative pressure rooms because of the risk of aerosolization. And you need to give uh, not a very high flow, you may come up with the low flow of uh, 20, 25 liters per minute. The reason would be the, the risk of uh, infection spread. Uh, 
it can be used in the single room but uh, of course in that single room when you you have a cohort of covid 19 patients but but and but it should not be used in those room who have we have a shared rooms or the emergency department because as i tell, told you about the risk of of this uh, of the of the of the aerosolization and of course it should not be used when you when you transfer your patient from one area to the other area in the in the hospital and what about the non invasive ventilation uh, non invasive ventilation of course the, the cpap and the bipap uh, you should use the CPAP and the BiPAP, but don't go with the high support. You may use a C, the BiPAP of IPAP 10 and 5. But if you think that your BiPAP demand is increasing, don't consider it. Because we have learned that, of course, it is a, it's a two-sword, uh, you know, uh, therapeutic intervention. Uh, some, it, 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 it can improve the situation or it delays the intubation as well. And the delays in the intubation can lead to the uh, the catastrophe as well and the the risk same like the high flow you need to use in the negative pressure rooms because of the risk of uh, aerosolization and also uh, you should not use it in the shared rooms or the emergency cubicles when other patients are also lying down uh, you know uh, side by side what monitoring you need? This is the important part. Uh, you need to monitor from the clinical picture. If you use the the, the high flow and the non-invasive, and you see the patient is comfortable, this is the best judgment. But what the other thing you need, you can measure the work of breathing, like respiratory rate, the heart rate settle down, the BP settle down, the tidal volume is you're not requiring more and more high uh, support of, of the of the of the IPAP. Uh, Sometimes clinicians use the ROCS score. The ROCS score is the 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 you know the, you divide the SpO2 with the FiO2 and the product of this to divide with the respiratory rate. And if the if, if the if the uh, if the you know the calculation factor is less than three, that means the patient is not uh, improving. It's worse. And you are, if, you're, if you monitor, monitor this, you know, this number, the scoring system, two hours, six hours, 12 hours, and you see that there is, is increasing, like previously it was three, now it was four, now it is 4.8, five, it means that the things are improving so that you can continue this, this, uh, this, uh, this therapy. But if you see that this is, uh, you know, the wastage, it's not improving, please go for the next intervention so this is my, my this was my last slide and i am ending my presentation over here it's uh, the forum is open for questions now thank you everyone for listening this talk thank you dr Fessel, for the excellent presentation there are many questions from the know, audience but uh, we'll select few uh, <clears throat> one question is what's the possibility of putting a healthy patient with COVID-19 on a ventilator because generally speaking uh, now what they are saying is that it's healthy hypoxemia without any respiratory stress so are we putting too much strain on a on the ventilator on our ICU services uh, you know uh, in, in this pandemic uh, area we talked about this um, the, the resource issue the supply and demand because of the less ventilators available and all uh, but, but, but you know, you need to think different, uh, uh, you need to think in all, all aspects, like uh, what, how much your expertise on, what's your clinical judgment, because maybe in one area of, uh, judge, one area of uh, someone has a good expertise, in the other area is not, they may go with the direct intubation or ventilation. I'm not, uh, this, this could be. So it all depends what your expertise kya hai. If, what type of system you have like if you have a negative pressure rooms okay uh, you have a good team available so you may start with the with the non-invasive ventilation uh, that's fine and you just start to monitor and uh, if you think that this monitoring improve this is this is fine but as I sort said to you this is the two two, <coughs> two sort is uh, two different problems either you may delay the intubation, this is fine, but you may come up with the problem like you delayed intubation, the patient deteriorate further, and now you are uh, ventilating since beginning in a very high ventilator support. 
because we have learned in the different uh, papers as well, those patients who put in on the machine, their mortality is high. We, 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 we know this as well. But as I said to you, all these things depend on what system you are working what sort of you know, facility you have available. Uh, so, so you can start with the simple oxygen therapy and see uh, but and kitni uh, monitoring facility available hai, and if your patient is comfortable with the simple oxygen therapy just keep them on this therapy and uh, you know because uh, it has time factor if the time goes uh, you know f fast the patient may come up with the you know uh, the, the, with, 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 uh, with the normal status in the next few days but if you start to deteriorate you may need to go with other interventions Thank you, Dr. Faisal. There's one more question. Uh, how to create a negative pressure room in a resource limited setup as ICU and government setup are such that 20 to 50, 12 to 15 beds would be placed in a in one big room. Uh, so how can a negative pressure uh, setup be developed? Yeah, okay, because you know, every setup has a different, uh, you know, uh, facility as I talked about. So in, in a very simple way, you should have a, a, a room, okay, and then you may create, you know, you may put a, 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 a you know, exhaust fan over there, and this exhaust fan, uh, you know, helps you in transmitting the air from inside to the outside. But it is not very much feasible in a very large area, uh, because, of course, this is not a very ideal phenomenon, uh, a very ideal one. Because the 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 the, the, trans, the air should not be in a single space. This is the you know the the ultimate problem. कि आपकी air वहाँ पे नहीं होने चाहिए. Air की transmission रहे, मुस्तकिल, ventilate होता रहे. So this is the most safest way. So what the the you know intermediate thing what we can do is कि आपके पास एक room है. इसमें आप जो है आप क्या कर सकते हैं कि हर वक्त हवा जो है वो 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 मूव करती है वो ये कि यू कैन पुट दी पुट द सिंपलेस्ट वे इज द एग्जॉस्ट फैन एंड मूव द एयर फ्रॉम इनसाइड टू द आउटसाइड दिस इज आई थिंक व्हाट आई कैन सजेस्ट ओके थैंक यू देयर फ्यू मोर क्वेश्चंस वन फ्रॉम आवर ओन सेटअप इज दैट दैट इफ द हाई फ्लो नेजल ऑक्सीजन इज दिस इंपॉर्टेंट व्हाई आर वी यूजिंग इट इन एक्यू why are not we using an AQ? In AQ, like the adult ICU right now hasn't got any HFNO device. Uh, because we don't have the you know the the machine available. You know, high flow is a you know the high flow is a humidified detoxin. We talked about this. We don't have the facility. But you know, the high flow and low flow in in terms of definition, you can give up with the with the oxygen. If you increase the oxygen, like. Uh, rebreathing 15 liters per minute. This is also the the, the high oxygen. But the problem with this, uh, as you know, some 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 को पता है कि problem क्या है कि जितनी ज़्यादा आप oxygen देंगे, जितना आपका flow ज़्यादा होगा, the risk of aerosolization ज़्यादा होगा. So अगर आपके पास system अच्छा है, uh, अगर आपके पास मरीज़ सारे मरीज़ एक ही covid area में हैं, ठीक है ना? You have a good PPE system, then okay, you 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 can use it. But if you don't have a good PPE, you know, available आपके पास डिफरेंट टाइप के मरीज है तो ऑफ कोर्स यू दिस इज वन ऑफ द लिमिटिंग फैक्टर के आप आप उसको कहाँ पे इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं टिपिकली अगर आप हाई फ्लो की बात करें तो वी वी डोंट हैव द हीटेड ह्यूमिडिफाइड ऑक्सीजन अवेलेबल इन इन वी आर वी हैव आस फॉर इट एंड मेड बी द नेक्स्ट टू डेज वी विल हैव इट but uh, the other thing would be uh, you can use it with the uh, normal uh, rebreathing as well but you need to understand the risk factor okay uh, i think you have uh, told but they want in detail ke what is the rox score and what would be its significance what the rox score is and what and, and what is the significance of rox so rox score usually uh, start with the for the high flow oxygen though like heated humidified oxygen high flow in key monitoring area and it has a good uh, sensitivity and specificity and uh, what it is you divide the saturation the spo2 in the percentage with the fio2 in percentage okay and the product of this you divide it with the respiratory rate so if the calculation factor the whatever you you calculated is less than uh, 4 like 3.8 3.5 and all this means that the patient 
is you know is, is not improving but the single factor has no value it is usually being used for the monitoring purpose like you do it in the first two hours and the second uh, in the six hours 12 hours 24 hours and you see the numbers are increasing like previously it was three now it is four then it is five it means the risk of intubation is progressively reducing and your therapy is working appropriately thank you dr fasal